uh, I wasn't entirely sure how deep and how much experience and how much background a lot of the folks have here uh, 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 in terms of interpreting, reading uh, papers about animal models and, and also the resources that for, are very familiar to me in terms of identifying which models are relevant to a particular uh, gene or, or disease. So I, I kind of took a uh, start with the basics approach and building up to some interesting examples uh, in terms of both animal models. I don't include a lot of examples from our GSEP, but there's a really interesting one that just came up in the last call. And I'll, I'll allude to that when I talk about some of the resources and how we might consider um, uh, consider existing animal models in terms of uh, helping with solve some of the um, questions that we have during curation. Um, okay, oops, sorry. So what I was going to present to you today was just to start with an, uh, an outline about animal models and some perspective on exactly what what does that mean? I think it, uh, uh, it's, it's a term that's thrown about, but I think there are different ways we can think about animal models that's really important in terms of interpreting uh, uh, how we look at the data that comes from them. Uh, I wanted to also then give you some background about forward and reverse genetics and bring you a little bit of history about mouse modeling in particular. I, I found that a lot of people actually don't know the, the old school background and I think it's an interesting it's an inter it's an interesting topic but also one that is helpful in terms of uh, uh, interpreting some of the, uh, the the things you read. Um, a very brief sojourn into modeling technology. It'll be very brief, but I think there's some important points that I'd like to make about different types of approaches that are used. Um, then I want to go into IMPC, which is the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, and also Mouse Genome Informatics Resources. In my view, these are the key places for you to go and find information. I know in the past you've had people from these two resources come and talk to you, but I wanted to give you my, my thoughts on that and also an update on, on where those resources stand today. Um, and then I have some really interesting disease model examples that help illustrate some of the points from before. And then finally, if there's time, I'd like to uh, uh, take a tour of, of sort of the challenges, but also the opportunities around genetic context. And at the end, I'll give you some of my thoughts, uh, sort of general pontification about uh, uh, animal models and how we can use them in, in the context of clean gen curation. Uh, I'd like to start here, and this is something that um, my colleague here at JAX, Rob Burgess, teaches in a course, and it really struck, uh, hit home to me. And, and really when we think about animal models and mouse models, in particular animal models in general, uh, it's important to think about what, why do we use them and what makes them good? Are they, what is a good model? And, and I think the first point is that all models are just that, they're models. There's no perfect model and we should not expect uh, an avatar of disease. They are tools that have been used to answer specific questions. But, you know, there's a few different ways we can think about uh, these existing models and, and how we um, interpret a particular question about uh, causation or the causative etiology of a given uh, variant or, or disease gene. And the first is uh, first thing we think about is face validity. Is it valid in terms of the, the phenotypes of the human disease? Uh, and there's a couple of questions that arise in my mind, at least, uh, uh, when we when we consider this. One is are the phenotypes that are measured similar? You know, are they actually? Is this even possible within a mouse model? Do do mice have the phenotypes that we care about? And and uh, if not, are there proxy phenotypes or other molecular signatures that can provide you with the same information regarding face validity that even though the mouse does not look exactly like uh, uh, the human? So can we look for things that provide that corroborating evidence? Um, the second, and this is becoming more and more important because the, our engineering capabilities continue to improve, is the construct validity. Does the phenotype happen for the right region, reason? And by that I mean is the mutation homologous? Uh, is does the molecular mechanisms match, et cetera. So basically how closely does the allele or mutation appear to reflect the allele or mutation uh, for the specific condition? And, and I'll come back to this in a moment in, in terms of how much this matters for, for curation purposes versus say uh, other applications and disease models. And then finally, predictive validity, uh, does manipulation of the model predict human outcomes? And this is critical for preclinical studies, perhaps not as important uh, for the group here today. Uh, and of course, what are they used for? And as I mentioned, one of the things that we, we 
clearly care about uh, within this group is validation of the causality of a novel variant of known significance or, or a variant uh, that's associated with disease uh, or a gene in, in, in this case as well. Um, obviously, models can be used for understanding biology and serving as a platform uh, for preclinical studies in vivo. Uh, and, and I think it's important to note that it's rare that a model can serve all purposes. So obviously, within the, the ClinGen group, we care mostly, maybe not necessarily a novel of unknown significance, but really, can we validate the causality of the gene as related to a particular disease? And this is the area that we focus our attention, which means to some degree, these other elements that when we, we typically think about in terms of building the best model may or may not be particularly relevant. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to, think, to keep in mind. Uh, I just put this in here. This is a, a highly modified version of a paper from Nature Reviews Genetics uh, uh, from a couple of years ago, a couple of year, or a year ago. Um, and, and there's a lot of models. Obviously, I'm going to talk about mice today. And, and what, when we, we try to think about these as, uh, you know, which one is being used is sort of related to uh, uh, sort of the cost benefit and the goals of this particular study. So for example, uh, C. elegans are really simple, they're really cheap to, to manage, uh, and their generation time is fast, et cetera, while mice are much more expensive and take a lot more, uh, take a lot more time generally uh, than these simpler model organisms. But there's a, a potentially, because they're a mammalian system, greater human relevance depending on the gene and the pathway model. Uh, and so for, for, for that reason, but also because this is where my area of expertise lies, I'm going to focus entirely on, on mouse models for the rest of, rest of this presentation. Um, okay, so I'm just going to give you a quick primer. And as I mentioned, some of the backstory or some of the background and how, uh, how in terms of the use of uh, mammalian systems such as the mouse. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, uh, uh, Laboratory mice are actually a, uh, uh, a mix of a variety of, um, of well, four different specific uh, subspecies of mice uh, uh, that diverged approximately a million years ago uh, into regionally across the globe. And these, uh, the, the key ones are the moose moose domesticus subspecies, which is uh, the most common one in Western Europe, and the moose musculus musculus subspecies, which is uh, it, primarily located in Eastern Europe, Russia, and Northern China. And there is certainly contribution from both uh, Castanius and Molossinus subspecies as well. These were all kept by what we, what we refer to as uh, mouse fanciers. This is actually what they referred to themselves as, who, who uh, kept mice and, and bred mice because they had interesting uh, phenotypic characteristics. Uh, such as coat color and, and, and shape and size, et cetera. And these were the source of the laboratory mice we, we use today, but they do come from all these different subspecies. Uh, and this is just another way to, to illustrate this and that the final uh, laboratory mouse that we have, as I mentioned, is primarily domesticus, which is represented actually by a wild derived strain, that, uh, an inbred strain that you can use today, 68%. Uh, 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 and smaller uh, contributions from the other uh, from the other subspecies. But what's interesting is that the musculus subspecies, even though it's uh, uh, quite close in terms of its uh, physical location to the uh, uh, to domesticus, uh, is a smaller uh, proportion than you might expect. So there's quite a bit of uh, uh, genetic diversity uh, that derives from the, not only the diversity within this one subspecies, but from this uh, additional subspecies. So the, the older way that we, as I mentioned, you know, the earlier models were all fancy mice. These were mice that had phenotypic characteristics that were interesting to people who kept mice. Uh, but this uh, phenotype driven approach was, was the standard approach to identifying novel mutations of human, that are relevant to human disease for, for many years. And this includes both uh, spontaneous mutations and chemical mutagenesis screens such as EMU. Uh, and these, of course, are what we refer to as uh, forward genetics. We, we look for the phenotype first and then we use genetic mapping and sequencing to identify the gene of interest. While reverse direct genetics is, is certainly much more common and popular today. And this is more gene driven. It includes transgenic models, targeted mutations, and now, of course, gene editing to create specific mutations of interest of a, of a given investigator. There's, there's a lot of value in both of these approaches. Um, 
Uh, obviously, if we're, we're talking about engineering a, a human disease model, gene-driven makes the most sense. However, in many cases, uh, what nature provides is, is actually incredibly informative. Um, this is just an interesting uh, 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 example of the types of mutations that over the years have been discovered at JAX as part of what we call our mouse clinic. It's actually part of the quality control process for the entire uh, colony that's distributed as a, as a resource to the, to the world. Uh, and that a large percentage of it are things that perhaps not surprisingly are relatively simple for us to see. So for example, behavior abnormalities, a colonist looking in a cage will see an abnormally behaving mouse. We then send those for, for uh, heritability testing. And then this is the source of identify, identification of a lot of novel disease related uh, genes. And I'll come to a, an example of this um, uh, towards the end. Uh, the old approach to finding these genes, of course, involved genetic mapping. Uh, we, we have, the, of course, the advantage of actually being able to structure our crosses however we like. And this is done, you know, sort of standard uh, uh, F2 cross that will allow us to identify regions of interest in the genome. Of course, getting down to gene back in the old days took a really long time. Uh, we didn't we didn't always have SNP panels available. And I just love to put this slide in here because I think it illustrates how far we've come, certainly in the technology uh, perspective. Uh, this is actually what they call a living linkage map that uh, Jack's presented. I can't remember what the conference is actually for this particular li linkage map, but these are actually all the heritable phenotypic markers that were used to map novel traits in the back in the day before we had molecular markers. And I think the savvy amongst you might see that we actually didn't even have chromosomes back in 1958. These are actually linkage groups, uh, not chromosomes, although the number is awfully close to what we have for actual mouse chromosomes overall. So uh, fortunately, we've moved well beyond that technologically, and uh, uh, we now are able to actually robustly identify uh, genes uh, underlying spontaneous and, and ENU-based mutations using exome sequencing, as of course you are in, in human genetics as well. And this has really revolutionized uh, uh, our approach to uh, revolutionize the, the potential for forward genetic approaches. I will say though, that the timing of this was really poor. There were a lot of great ENU screens going on prior to the innovations that allowed us to do exome sequencing. And so I think, um, uh, uh, the, the, the technologies didn't quite align perfectly, although there are some, and some great uh, uh, forward genetic screens, Bruce Boiler, for example, uh, that have gone on over the years since then. And of course, uh, technology is still improving. Not only can we find point mutations, but uh, uh, Laura Reinhold, my colleague here at JAX, and others are developing methods very much similar to what's going on in the human field of divining uh, uh, the actual structural mutations that underlie a lot of these mutations from the Illumina sequencing itself. So, uh, but I think most of the things you will encounter uh, as curators will be engineered mouse models. So I just wanted to briefly go through this. Um, there's a number of different types of models. Uh, I think a lot of you are very well aware. Uh, I don't want to belabor this or, or get too remedial here in terms of uh, uh, the technology, but I think there's a couple points I'd like to make along the way. So obviously the oldest uh, approach uh, is the transgenic models. Uh, there are knockout, knock-in, conditional, and many more. And I'm going to go through these uh, uh, quickly here. So transgenes, of course, are, are the oldest technology that we have at our disposal. Uh, they have a number of specific elements, but overall, the, the goal here is to express a gene of interest, whether that's a disease gene or a, or a reporter gene, et cetera. Uh, and it does so using a promoter uh, and, and sometimes some other elements that drive the expression the best, as, uh, as one can predict. To a particular uh, within a particular uh, expression domain that's relevant. Uh, a couple of things to know here is that these are typically small. Uh, there are back transgenics, but these are typically small, uh, and and they are random. So, um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, so the uses here is I, this is the oldest model for disease model engineering, and I, again I have a great example of this where things have not added up as or, or not worked out as well as people had originally hoped. They're also used as reporters for gene expression, as I mentioned. They're extremely highly utilized as tools for creep drivers. Uh, they allow for temporal expression, uh, spatial gene expression. Um, and they are, in many cases, uh, uh, used for overexpression of disease alleles to build what we would call disease models. And these include human back transgenics. But I'd like to at least 
suggest that these these methods and these models that are in high use today, for example, Alzheimer's disease research have a lot of challenges associated with them, and a lot of people are trying to move away from them. And this is this is due, in fact, to their uh, uh, poor performance in terms of translatability uh, and building therapeutics. And and there's a lot of reasons for this, and uh, uh, for any given model, the reasons that they don't work out are, are complex, but these are some of the challenges that we face when we're dealing with transgenes. Um, the first is that, as I mentioned, integration is random, and the context in which these integrations occurs do matter. Uh, integration, and I'm going to show you an illustration of this, is often accompanied by uh, structural variations in the genome, uh, and this is these can be complex uh, or, or relatively simple deletions. Uh, and, and along with this, they can interrupt and kind of delete endogenous genes. And, and I think this is an important point to consider when, when thinking about whether or not a given transgene is actually uh, a disease model gene. You put a gene in there and you overexpress it, but what have you done with the genome? Uh, and, and which event is actually causing the phenotype of interest? Um, in some cases, the copy number is high. You're basically massively overexpressing these, and these can be unstable and you lose the phenotype. And you may question, what does it mean to overexpress something at an extremely high level? What does that mean in terms of disease consequences? Uh, BACs solve some of this, but there are a limited number of elements that are included in a transgene. Um, uh, so there can be unexpected expression outcomes. And, and finally, the number of limited applications uh, are limited to primarily overexpression. So obviously, targeted precise integration offers many advantages on that. I'll talk about that more. Uh, this is just an illustration of what we found. We, we were working with um, another group that had come developed a technology that we thought would be actually quite good at identifying transgene integration sites, which historically have actually been quite difficult to identify using inverse PCR and other methods because of the multi-copy nature of the integration. And what we found was actually somewhat surprising. We were really successful. We, found, we targeted about 40 of these and really found the integration of all of them. What was really surprising to us um, was that not only were there fairly frequent structural variations, in fact, large structural variations of megabase size deletions accompanying the integration, but these were often genic. They integrated either within an exon or within an intron. And in retrospect, this does make some sense to us that these are areas that are permissible for gene expression, but it is a, a cautionary tale about how you interpret the results of a, of a given transgenic line, whether if it's related to disease models or if it's being related to a disease phenotype, sorry. Um, engineered models, by contrast, they are targeted. They're not random. They're, they're specifically engineered to target a particular locus in the genome. Um, this means the expression is typically uh, closer to endogenous levels. Um, the engineering technology, it allows for a huge range of allele types, and it's really limited to the imagination. Uh, we can basically engineer almost any uh, technology where we begin to run into challenges at the multi-hundred KB size of, of engineering, but really most, most smaller scale engineering is simple. Uh, and CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, technology has opened the door to a wide range of strain backgrounds and other model organisms. So we're not limited to a, a, a specific set of mouse strains and mouse um, backgrounds overall. Um, these are just sort of, this is just an illustration of the types of alleles we can generate um, uh, and, and what the, you know, how, what we refer to them as. Uh, so obviously we can make knockouts, we can remove an exon and, or an entire gene and, and delete and, and knock out its function. Uh, more often, and perhaps more relevant to this group, we can make a human equivalent knock-in. By that, I mean identify an orthologous uh, residue within an exon uh, or in, within a gene and, and basically recapitulate the human, uh, usually the human amino acid change specifically within that exon. And that's relatively straightforward, particularly with CRISPR to do. Um, we can go further, and sometimes this is important, particularly for generating preclinical models. We can humanize a great, the knock into a greater extent. For example, replacing the entire uh, exon three with a human exon three, such that the surrounding sequences are identical to the human. Uh, we can even replace the entire gene uh, in some cases uh, with, a, with a human gene. We can create conditional knock-ins where essentially we have the wild type uh, gene with a, with a cDNA 
we, we remove that, we reveal the disease uh, exon, uh, and that allows us to get past some challenges with uh, embryo lethality. And of course, and I'm not going to talk about this at all, we can make conditional knockouts with free drivers that uh, allow us to delete genes in, in time and space. Um, and the reason I want to mention this is that there's a general perception that, um, you know, as we go down this list, there's greater precision. And I think that is true to some extent. And that, uh, clearly the degree of difficulty is higher, but it's certainly within our capabilities. But the question is, is always the assumption that each is better uh, as, you, as you become more precise. And, I, and I'd like to say that that's not necessarily so. I think we have to look at what the question is in order to, to uh, select the best model. Now, obviously, if you're making something that's an IND enabling uh, preclinical model, you may, well, and, your, and your therapeutic approach is an antisense oligo nucleotide, you're going to want something that has more human relevant sequences in, in the, around the mutation. But if you're asking the question, is this disease gene or this allele associated with, um, uh, with, with a particular phenotype, a knockout for loss of function, or perhaps a knock-in if we predict gain of function may be sufficient. And in fact, some of these models can be more challenging because you're mixing and matching human elements that may not be compatible with, say, a protein uh, interaction network, et cetera. So uh, uh, don't necessarily assume more precise or more advanced, I guess, is better. And I, 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 this is just to reiterate that point. You know, as the question is, as you're doing your curation, is the construct validity actually critical? Can a knockout actually answer the question? Uh, however, I would say that the full allelic series is often helpful in establishing the genotype phenotype relationship, particularly in the case of loss of function, missense mutations that perhaps are not complete loss of function. Having a missense and a knockout to show sort of the, the increase in phenotypic severity provides great corroboration uh, that, that, the, that the gene is involved. Um, what, uh, two other key things that I think um, need to be considered is, are the key phenotypes examined in a particular paper? We can make the right construct, but if they didn't look for the phenotype that's a particular question in your, in your curation, I think uh, uh, oftentimes it's not. And I think the ascertainment bias is quite common. Uh, and I'll come back to this because I think G, the GCEPs and the and ClinGen have a, the right approach on this. Uh, and finally, what phenotypes are effectively modeled in the mouse? In some cases, the phenotype may not be something that um, we can even really effectively measure uh, in a mouse model. We can do more than some model organisms, but it, it, there are cases where it's very difficult. Okay, so I'm going to transition here talk about model resources. I think these are things that you will actually access uh, regularly, or I would advise that you ask, access re regularly uh, in order to, to look and see what's available. Um, I wanted to start out, and, and this is a little bit self-serving, this is a project I've worked on for a number of years uh, in terms of building resources that uh, are, are structured to interrogate the entire genome. This is um, just an illustration of the timeline uh, of really what our mouse engineering capabilities have led to. Uh, if we think back, the first knockout mouse was back in uh, 1989. We were using spontaneous and ENU mutations, as I mentioned, for many years before this, but 1989 was the first knockout mouse. It did take a quite a bit of time before this ramped up. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, a large scale initiative was launched to, to target the entire uh, genome because it, it, it became clear that this was not only feasible, but would yield uh, many insights into, into the underlying causes of disease, but also just gene function generally. And so I'm going to tell you about some of these resources because I think you're going to encounter them more and more as these models get out into the scientific community. Um, just so you, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, the Knockout Mouse Phenotyping Program, or, or COMP2 as we call it, uh, is part of this international effort to generate phenotype null allele for every protein coding gene in the genome. This is the NIH funded component to that effort overall. A few key features I'd like, I'd like to mention. Uh, one is that this is being done on a uniform genetic background. Uh, I'll come back to this at the end. There are, there's bonus, there's pluses and minuses to this. The uniformity allows us to reduce the noise that comes from uh, uh, sort of segregating genetic backgrounds, but it limits potentially the generalizability of our results. Um, the other key thing, and I'm gonna go into this more because you're gonna see these, uh, uh, are the, the defined validated alleles that are generated. Um, 
these are, are very standardized, so it's really simple to understand what exactly is being done. Uh, and then also, uh, this also comes with standard phenotyping protocols. Because this can't be done in one center, uh, the, the data is, is uniform across the consortium as much as that is possible. Two other key things, uh, that, uh, that two other key principles, I guess, of the program are, are the rapid data release through mousephenotyping.org, and I'll point this out as a resource for you, uh, and also the open availability of the mouse model resources themselves, less important to this group, but certainly important to the community. Uh, these are two things that, of course, are challenging when we wait for individual investigators to generate this baseline information about genes. Uh, these two things don't, don't always happen the way we wish them to happen. So uh, the comp program is three centers. Uh, there's, there's been two phases thus far. You can see this one, the current phase is almost done. Our group has generated, uh, or the NIH funded groups have generated about 5,500 knockouts. Uh, working with our international partners, the goal is to complete the genome, and we're actually applying for the final phase of this project right now. I mentioned an international group overall. You can see it's all over the world. Uh, it was led initially by a lot of groups in Europe, but our colleagues in Asia have really uh, started to, to ramp up their uh, activities as well, and also other parts of, uh, of the world as well. Um, just to give you a, just a, a, a taste, I guess, of the scope of what we've done so far. So overall, that's microinjections or electroporations or production attempts over, well, 13,600 production attempts so far. That's a huge number of uh, manipulations of the genome that have been undertaken. It's resulted in about 9,500 knock knockouts uh, that have been on the ground, uh, of which you know there's a, there's a lag here uh, about 7,500 genes have been phenotyped completely. Uh, and this data release 13, so these are come out in these uh, periodic data releases, about 7,300 lines, of course, tons of data points and lots of images and so forth. Um, this, this begs a question, what exactly, how, how much of the genome is actually left to do or how much have we done? So uh, my colleague, Kevin Peterson here at Jax and I have recently kind of, we wanted to answer this question. We really what's left in the genome. And if we calculate the number, of, or we, we actually identify the number of knockouts that have been made by the community, uh, those that have been made by the IMPC, and those that have, where we overlap to some degree, although we endeavor not to overlap, you can see using CRISPR-Cas9, there's very little overlap overall. Uh, what we find is that um, if we count only mouse human orthologs, which relevant to human disease, I would argue that that, that makes sense. Um, there's actually only 3,300, 3,400 genes re remaining in the genome that have yet to be targeted, which I think is quite remarkable. This is just with knockouts. I, there are additional alleles out there for some of these genes, although I would say the vast majority fall into this category. It is interesting that our colleagues decided to knock out 786 uh, uh, mouse-specific genes or genes without a clear one-to-one -one human ortholog. I'd be curious to investigate that a little further, but I think the point I'd like to make is that the knockout resources are nearly complete, and those are really valuable. Those will be really valuable information for you and your curation. Um, I'd like to spend a few minutes here on the alleles. I think this is a while well, I talked about the standardization and uh, uh, the the transparency that the IMPC provides as a as a resource. The one thing I will say, and questions I get all the time are about the alleles because they're complicated and they're complicated to understand. So I, I found uh, at a Cold Spring Harbor course that people found this very valuable to kind of go through the structure of the, of the comp alleles um, or the IMPC alleles. So two of them are relatively straightforward. So one is, in, and you don't see a lot of these, there's about 3,800, I think, total from uh, Regeneron Corporation has a technology known as Velocigene that they've used to generate what they call a definitive null, which is a knockout of the entire coding sequence. In all cases, they're knocking in these laxy markers, but we've deleted all the endogenous exons. And so, um, so that is pretty simple to understand. Start to stop in for the vast majority of these genes uh, with a laxy marker. The uh, uh, design produced by the Sanger Institute or, or, or uh, developed by the Sanger Institute uh, is more complex, but it's also multifunctional. And I'll go through this in a little more detail. But the idea here is it's a knockout first using a gene, gene trapping strategy, uh, but also has the potential to become uh, a conditional allele uh, 
by inserting these LOX P sites. And notably, though, this gene trapping is imperfect, so we can also make what we would call a definitive null. That is a, a gene trap plus the loss of a critical exon. This was primarily done in phase one of the uh, uh, comp program. Phase two, for reasons that are probably obvious to most people, we moved almost entirely to CRISPR-mediated deletions, exon deletions, basically targeting the same critical exons to create a frame shift and nonsense-mediated decay. And we have other strategies for genes that don't fit to, into, that, um, into that framework. Um, this is much less costly, uh, much faster, much uh, uh, allows us to do this at much higher throughput. And the allele nomenclature for these is really simple. You see EM1 with the IMPC logo in the, in the superscript. That means it's one of these CRISPR deletion alleles, and you can go into MGI and find exactly what's been deleted. The can, Sanger alleles are a little more complicated. They were, they were produced by two different programs. This is UCOM and a second program in the US called Corey Sanger Davis. Don't need to know this so much, but it's important to really recognize what this alphabet soup of nomenclature actually means because you're, you will see a lot of these. Um, so the first is that this TM1A isoform is the native allele. And this is a gene trap, essentially, uh, that may or may not be a functional null. Uh, these can be converted, and for our IMPC programs, they are converted to the deletion allele, which is called uh, this TM1B. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is a considered a definitive null because it's not only a gene trap, but it creates a frame shift mutation through removal of a critical exon. These can also be converted into this conditional allele. This is given this designation of TM1C. And then finally, uh, when this is deleted, uh, this conditional is deleted, you'll see a TM1D. You don't see this very often, uh, but uh, just in case you do. There's also another element to these, uh, uh, this alphabet soup. The production center that created the allele ESL in the first place is up here in the parentheses. Uh, and there's a few, two different major species of that. Uh, the lab code that created those ESLs, so Sanger, uh, or Welcome Trust Sanger Institute, um, MBP, you'll see these other ones as well. Uh, and finally, the J at the end, of course, is where the mouse was made. So uh, hopefully that's a helpful primer. You'll have these slides, but I, I found people uh, find a decoder ring for this, for this structure useful. And as I mentioned, this top one could be hypomorphic, and this lower one uh, would be considered a definitive null. Uh, resources, I think, uh, I know Terry Meehan has spoken at this group before, but we have um, a portal with a lot of, as you can see, a lot more data in it now. Uh, and and uh, as I mentioned, these are released in um, full data releases periodically, but it's really important to note that the current data, even before the data release, is available here. So you can always come to this resource and see what's uh, hot off the presses and actual experimental results are available. So you can drill down and actually look at the data yourself. And I'll show you what I mean in a moment. Um, the other thing that's really a value, and I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but the, the concept around the IMPC is to be as comprehensive as possible in terms of uh, illuminating potential phenotypes that are disease relevant, but also illustrate the you know, fundamental functions of, one of the fundamental functions of these genes. Uh, and so there's a wide variety of, uh, uh, different modalities that are applied to, to capture phenotypes in different areas. And so uh, this is just illustrated here. Uh, and that, as I mentioned, is not always true uh, in individual investigator uh, papers. They go typically much more in depth into a given phenotype, but not necessarily uh, look broadly in terms of the potential pleiotropic effects. These are what the gene pages look like. And this is just an example of one of the genes that's come up recently uh, in, in a curation effort. You can see this gene sent J. It's been uh, generated by the IMPC. Uh, and it's actually been characterized by um, uh, the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute. I don't know why NOVA data is available for viability. These are viable. Um, at least the, uh, the TM1A allele is. And it is important to know which allele has been phenotyped. And what's great is you can see both the p-value for individual uh, uh, phenotype uh, assertions, but you can actually go in here and find these data as well. Um, similarly, the data are available in MGI, and all the IMPC results at each data release are, are released to MGI. And, and in my view, MGI should actually be your first stop when you're looking for 
is there a mouse model of, of my given disease? And there's a few different places you can go. Obviously, you search in here, you get to the gene, and you see some information. What's interesting is they even uh, identify the potential human disease uh, associations as well. Uh, but it takes a little learning, a little experience to navigate MGI. But once you do it, it's really straightforward. I like to start here with all mutations and alleles. Um, and, and I think the other thing to make sure, and I want to mention this, is that double check PubMed. I know people start with PubMed a lot, but definitely look for the last 12 to 18 months. There is definitely a lag in MGI curation. They can only do this so fast, but they do a, really a remarkable job overall. So when you look in the individual alleles, what you can see is you can see all sorts of one that tells you what type of allele it is, uh, gives you some uh, common names that people like to stick into their papers. You can see here, we see all the flavors of these IMPC alleles I mentioned before, in addition to a standard knockout um, that was produced by another group. Um, you can also, and I think this is perhaps the more important place to go, is look at um, these uh, alleles in, in uh, phenotype alleles. And so you can see here, it lists all the phenotypes, the data source, which you can link to, um, and the alleles that are involved. What I wanted to note, which is pretty interesting for this particular uh, gene target, is that we see a really different phenotype between the TM1A allele and the definitive TM1B allele, where you're getting embryonic lethality here, but viability here. And this is an illustration of the potential hypomorphic nature of these TM1A alleles. And of course, this is one that we actually encountered in uh, the GCEP, uh, the syndromic GCEP. Uh, and the question was, Raise, and this is just, I'm just going to put it out here. If the house, if the mouse data itself can help resol resolve some curation dilemmas. So, this is uh, this gene SEMJ is loss function is reported to cause both microcephaly six and suckle syndrome. And this sort of assertion is supported by a single publication, only by a single publication. But of course, this uh, mouse paper actually claims that it phenocopies suckle syndrome, and they present a lot of evidence for that. So, uh, I'm not going to go any to further depth here. But except to say that uh, I think it can be often valuable to include the mouse model data in your, in your original curation conception of uh, potential, the, the potential um, link between a given disease in, in, a, in, in a gene mutation. Okay, so uh, I'm doing okay for time, but I'm gonna try to go quickly through some examples. I think examples are the best way uh, to illustrate because as I'm, I'll mention at the end, Every evaluation, there isn't an algorithm for this, and every evaluation is, is sort of custom. Um, the first one I wanted to mention is this uh, disease modeling of meme and PIC disease type C, MPC1. It's, a, it's a quite a rare, extremely rare disorder, only 500 patients uh, in the US, and it's uh, characterized by uh, onset neurodegeneration, metabolic disease, ataxia, and, and seizures. Um, it's a mutation of, on a cholesterol transporter, which leads to uh, cholesterol accumulation in neurons and other tissues as well in cell death. Um, severe forms are loss of function, while there are milder forms that are due to hypomorphic sense mutations. Uh, and I like to note this because this is a case where the, the mouse uh, discovery helped uh, identify, that, helped with the cloning of the human gene. Uh, when we look at the mice, there are a couple of different alleles. Both of these, I believe, are ENU alleles. This one certainly is, and I think this one is as well. Um, they exhibit some of the uh, features. Both of them die early. They are ataxic. They were identified in these ENU screens as being ataxic. They uh, exhibit significant loss of function in terms of protein. Uh, this is just a Western for NPC1. You can see the mutants, whether it's the NIH or the NMF mutant, are both uh, either uh, completely loss of function or mostly loss of function. And then when you stand for cholesterol accumulation in the brain, you can see cholesterol, the red staining here is for cholesterol. You can see it accumulates in neurons. Um, so the question is, is this a good model? I think from a face validity perspective, I would say, yes, this is really good overall. Um, the, the, there's cholesterol accumulation, there's neurodegeneration, which I didn't show you. There's lethality, there's uh, uh, other aspects. There's ataxia, which, uh, um, which is um, uh, uh, was how it was identified. Uh, there are no seizures, so there's some aspects of the phenotypes that don't fully recapitulate. But this is, I think, this is uh, some of the key features are captured, and I think that's really uh, a good. It's a good model from that perspective. Uh, construct validity, and this is where people might question it because these are spontaneous or, or in this case, ENU induced mutations that are identified. 
uh, in that screen, but they're loss of function mutations. And those are loss of function mutations of both mouse and human. Are they in the same domains? Are they in the same spots? No, but I think from a construct validity perspective, this is actually quite strong. And then predictive validity, I think this does remain to be seen. I, I actually am not sure, I haven't checked up on it. Uh, will of course develop, uh, depend on the therapeutic strategy. Uh, so for example, a, 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 genetic, a gene therapy or a, even a gene editing approach, maybe, maybe not. Um, another example I think is really instructive is uh, ALS. Um, so uh, I think everybody here knows what ALS is. Uh, um, uh, and uh, it, it's comma, it's frequency in the human population. It's obviously it's loss of motor neurons uh, leading to paralysis and death. Um, Early on, I think it was identified that uh, about 10% of cases were familial. Uh, SOD1 was the first gene that was associated uh, with familial ALS. And so some of the early mouse models uh, were generated by an overexpression of this mutant SOD1 gene, one of the mutants, uh, mutations that have been found in humans, uh, this G93 mutant. There are others that have been produced as well, although I'll say this is the model that has this most severe effect. Uh, median survival is 150 days, which is pretty short for a mouse. Mouse live a few years. So, uh, but uh, actually kind of a pain in terms of uh, studying it because that's not very long, or that, that is kind of long. The, the mice actually do develop uh, phenotypes that have um, relevance to, uh, to ALS. So you can see here, this is just staining of a motor neuron junction. And uh, what you can see here is that the red, which, uh, um, which uh, uh, stains the, uh, 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 the, the sort of muscle side of the, in the diaphragm, and the green is the motor neuron, uh, uh, it's, it's disrupted in the SOD 93A mutant, mutation. Uh, and what you can see is that um, there is a genetic background effect, but neither case the SOD1 transgenics do die uh, relatively early, but it does depend on the genetic background. But the problem with this is um, uh, despite this face validity uh, and potential construct validity, that is a human disease mutation, uh, there's been a huge problem in the translatability of this model. It has really failed to be useful in terms of all clinical trials and other, and even the replication of some of those original results, of some of the key results have been extremely challenging. And part of this, I think, is due to either uh, poorly designed studies, but I also think um, this model being a highly overexpressed transgenic version of a human disease gene also might not be appropriate. We're, we're really expressing this at extremely high levels, there's a lot of proteins you can express at extremely high levels that can give you a phenotype. So I think um, it's an example of how perhaps more precise models would be more useful and, and easier to interpret. And then the final one, I think this is something that I wanted to just bring up with this group, uh, is how non-germline mouse data might be useful. And there are some gaps in the way these are reported in FGI, although fortunately you can find this in, in PubMed as well. Um, so this is a project I was actually involved in um, with uh, uh, collaborators who reached out to me, uh, Cecilia Lowe, who I've worked with for a lot of years, along with Chris Gordon, who's in, at Paris, in, in, in Paris. And they had a group of patients with uh, heterotaxy and congenital heart disease and, and had found uh, through sequencing that these are, uh, they believe this was linked to uh, mutations in MF, this gene MMP21, which is not been associated with either of these phenotypes in the past. Uh, they wanted to corroborate these findings in an animal model, but they wanted to do this very, very quickly, which as you know, as I mentioned before, is very, very challenging in an animal model. So what we did is we worked with them to uh, take advantage of what we had been observing was the extreme high efficiency of CRISPR to engineer uh, uh, specific patient mutations or orthologous mutations into the mouse and see whether or not we could recapitulate the phenotype. And what you see here is just an example of the high degree of editing of the 15 and 34 embryos we, we recovered, we had a, a 100% and 59% were edited, but what was really interesting is the vast majority of these actually had a relevant phenotype and that's shown here. Uh, these are the organs uh, of a mid-gestation mouse embryo and normally the heart points to the left and the stomach is on the left, as you know. Uh, we found embryos with situs inversus and this was associated with a point mutation and a knockout mutation. 
And we'd also find cases of heterotaxy, which is sort of a, a randomization of, of, the, of the orientation of the CTUs. And this, in this case, it was a knockout, but we saw these allelic combinations in all cases. And these were indeed associated with congenital heart disease. And this was uh, uh, part of a paper uh, that we were able to contribute to in short order. And so I think this is a good example of the types of uh, uh, experiments you might see more of in the future, which is taking advantage of new technologies in order to provide corroborating data uh, uh, for, uh, for a particular phenotype. Okay, so the final, and I do have a couple minutes, and I want to zip through this because I think this is going to be of, of some interest. I don't know from a curation perspective uh, uh, that you can really sort of change how you approach it, but I, I, I think it's just good information that people should be aware of. So genetic context, which is the genetic background or the genetic strain, uh, is really important. So most animal models are generated on a single inbred strain, on inbred strains, but particularly a single inbred strain to reduce the variation, but we know this matters. And I think there's, there are examples, and I'll show you one, where model failures are actually due to the wrong context. Um, so as I mentioned, there's lots of different inbred strains. These, these are derivative of those fancy mice, and you can see the types of things that fans, mouse fanciers were interested in with different coat colors, shape, size, behavior, and so forth. Uh, one thing that, you know, one observation we've made is that even the most fundamental phenotypes seem to vary significantly across these inbred strains. This is natural gestation, something you think you would, you might intuitively think would be pretty uh, uh, canonized in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, buffering to variation. No, it doesn't appear to be the case. We actually see almost a two-day difference between uh, strains at the two ends of the extremes in terms of their natural gestation length. Yet they're all born. The ones that, that are born early are not premature. They're just born early. So uh, it, it goes to show that there's a, a, a ton of complexity in different uh, in these strain backgrounds. And the example I wanted to show you is a human disease case where um, mutations in OMIM, for example, are uh, in PR, PRKRA are, are um, thought to cause dystonia or, or, or associated with dystonia 16 in, in humans. These are early onset, progressive limb dystonia, abnormal gait, et cetera. Uh, and these are um, caused by a, a frame shift recessive, recessive mutations of PRKRA. But the first four mouse alleles that we identified as spontaneous mutants were, well, they were little ears. They had none of these other features. They, they showed no abnormalities. They lived a long life. They had little ears, and that was it. However, uh, at one point, I forget what year it was, we, we identified a model that arose, a fifth allele that arose on different strain background. This is the BTBR strain, which is kind of an oddball strain. Um, and sure enough, they had these kinky tails, they had dystonia paralysis, it was progressive, and they died by three weeks. They had motor neuron loss, loss and they had the craniofacial, uh, craniofacial dysmorphologies as well. Um, and uh, in fact, they, the kinky tails were due to this dystonia because after they were euthanized, they, the, the tails would relax. So it's an example where we began to, the specific humans relevant phenotype emerged when we modified the genetic background. And in this case, nature modified it for us. This is a spontaneous mutation that occurred on this background. And the other example I think is important to note is uh, uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, the classic model and most widely one used model was on uh, B610 background, which is kind of a weird model, but it does, um, it, it was the most widely used in the mild symptoms and belated uh, onset. However, when my colleague Catlett's moved it to, to the, um, um, the D2 background, uh, DBA2J background, basically it was, it revealed all of the relevant phenotypes. And, and there's a variety of reasons for this I don't have time to go into, but. Uh, it's, it's another example of why genetic context matters. Okay, so finally, and I, I finished not too late, um, just some final thoughts. And, and as I mentioned before, I, I really don't think there's an algorithm for evaluating mouse evidence. Each review is bespoke. You have to kind of look at it, but use these sort of thoughts and principles and resources I've mentioned along the way. I think they can, uh, I think they can be really valuable early on in sort of the, the sleuthing of these uh, curations, uh, not just necessarily as the, the checkbox that we add later, but that's just my perspective. Um, I think the one thing I'd like to encourage is to consider the evidence the model provides, not what's missing. That's often what we hear about is that, well, it shows this, but it doesn't show that. 
Um, given the questions that you have, I, I think it's it's important to not um, expect the mice to have everything that humans have. They're not humans. Uh, and whether or not the evidence that is provided is enough, uh, it corroborates some of the findings. And I think, uh, I actually really like the way the GSEP does this, is it stores what it finds, not what it doesn't find. And I think the system is, is pretty useful in this regard. A few other things that have come up, and I, and I think these are just food for thought, I guess. Embryonic lethality is frequently what we find with knockouts of, of loss of function mutations that are seen in, uh, in some of these human disease alleles, particularly those that are dominant in humans. Is this evidence? Uh, we know there's a lot of cases where we, we know that embryonic lethal genes, essential genes, are highly enriched for human disease. It's something uh, my colleagues and I have worked on in the IPC for a long time. But really, that's, that's, that's at the global level. It doesn't actually, it's kind of like PLI. PLI is useful, but it doesn't necessarily, you can't really, it's not evidence per se. So I, as much as I, I think it's really helpful, and perhaps if you're doing exome sequencing for, for picking your prioritized candidates, I don't think it's, it's something we can really consider unless those lethal phenotypes are relevant to the disease. As I mentioned before, I think precision is great, uh, but it's not always essential to establish the corroborating evidence that you're looking for. Uh, so I think it's important to consider the goals of the GSEP. It's not, we're not, we're not developing preclinical models. And then the final thing, and this occurred to me while I was putting this together, is that really the, the really fabulous curation work that each and all of you do, um, in my view, is identifying gaps. Uh, and this comes up in the calls that we have where the animal model evidence is either missing or it's incomplete or it's lacking. And it occurred to me, I'm on one GSEP, but this certainly can be true on many GSEPs. Um, whether or not, uh, you know, this could be, if these gaps could be somehow uh, cured, collated and, and communicated in some way, because I think the mouse community or the animal modeling community generally would love to know where those gaps are, where the, where the easy wins are in terms of generating additional useful evidence or uh, uh, models that, um, you know, ultimately could become uh, more preclinically relevant in the future. So, uh, you know, we'll, we find these things and then we say, okay, well, that would be a great one for mouse modeling, but how is that, how is that captured and could that be captured by this group and, and communicated to the wider scientific community? So um, with that, I'm just going to stop there and, and ask if there's any uh, questions and uh, thanks for, thanks for listening to my tour of and potpourri of mouse genetics. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Murray. Um, I see we do have a question uh, from Deb. Um, how do you know which background is best? And is there any background checker? Uh, for example, never do X phenotype on Y background um, papers that have it are questionable, et cetera. Yeah, that's, so that's, a, that's a really great question. And, and it's one that we're pondering ourselves now because we're part of a program to, um, to develop precision models. We have a new grant to develop these precision models and we, you know, our, our default is to go through and, and engineer them on black six because it's standardized and we have context with other knockouts, but which one to pick is hard. There are um, certain phenotypes that we know are sensitized, but, but I would say as a general rule, the answer is we don't know. And, and one of the goals that we have as part of this uh, precision genetic center grant is actually to develop some methods to help to help us with that question. Um, it, it's even harder to know if um, somebody who's engineered it and published it, et cetera, picked the right background, if what they're missing is because it's the wrong background. But there are certain phenotypic features uh, that are, uh, make certain uh, strains good models. For example, I'll just give you one example. Uh, DBA2J is a model of glaucoma. And so uh, engineering alleles related to glaucoma on the DBA2J would probably be beneficial um, and then we know certain strains, for example, have age-related hearing loss or other sorts of things that you should maybe avoid if you're looking for deafness genes, if you're looking to model deafness genes. So we have a few of those, but I think um, a, a broader framework for making that decision about which background is not there. I, I think it's not there yet, but it is, it, I would say, is an incredibly important question as we're beginning to ramp up our, our interest and capabilities in modeling more and more rare uh, disease genes, uh, or even common disease genes. And yeah, it's a really sort of interesting question. And 
as we were talking about this, I did wonder, you know, do these differences in the impact of the background inform in any way the disease process? Like, I mean, are there protective factors in those mice that are not showing the phenotype versus those that do? And maybe that's too big a question for now, but I was just curious if that's oh, something looking. Absolutely. So modifier genetics is is extremely fruitful area. Um, and uh, some of my colleagues have done amazing work in looking. So uh, Sue Ackerman, who was a former faculty here at Jackson, is now in uh, U uh, UC uh, San Diego, uh, really had an amazing story uh, over the last several years of not only finding the underlying causes of a, of a, of a um, cere cerebellar degeneration disease, so an ataxia gene, but also the modifier of that showing that it was the tRNA uh, was the modifier. So modifier genetics is, is really um, uh, been extremely fruitful, but it's a ton of work, right? Mm -hmm. So um, can we use that, you know, modifier screens? If we know this is a disease model, we'd love to find why, uh, you know, uh, suppressive factors or resilience factors, et cetera. That's definitely a great area of interest. My colleague, Kas Catherine Kazarowski here at uh, JAX is, is using some models of uh, Alzheimer's disease, which I, I think she concedes are imperfect because they are the transgenic models. But her question is really interesting, is if you look at uh, diverse genetic backgrounds, can you identify resilience factors to uh, the, the, the AD phenotypes that these models do have uh, and has found some really interesting hits overall. So it is definitely from a research perspective, an area of, uh, that, can be, that can be quite fruitful. But these are big projects. They are not, yeah. not a small project, but they can be very clinically relevant. Great. Super interesting. Um, so I realize we're at the top of the hour, but does anyone have any other quick questions for Dr. Murray? No. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Murray. This was just so uh, helpful to go through all this information and just amazing to see how much progress has been made by IMPC and, and COMP on you know, looking at all these different disease genes. So um, just really appreciate you being here today. So thank you, you so it. much. You do it. If people have questions um, about, you know, particularly IMPC resources, um, uh, but mouse modeling in general, happy to answer any questions uh, that people might have come up. Great. Well, we really appreciate it. So thank you so much. And um, everyone will look forward to talking with you again in a couple of weeks. And I will uh, share the recording uh, link by tomorrow. So thanks great. so much, everybody. Have a great okay. day. Thank you. Bye-bye.